Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the LLS Seasonal Spring Climate Outlook. You're here with John Welsh and myself from Ag Econ, and we'll be going through this afternoon uh, looking at the seasonal outlook and also running through some decision support systems. Um, John will start, we'll, he'll go through the technical detail for about uh, 20 minutes and then I will follow for about at 10 and then we'll open up for um, some questions. Now you're all on mute so to ask questions you can see on the right hand side of your screen there's a little chat bar um, and you can ask questions there just type them in and we will if we see them at the time we'll um, address them as they come up otherwise we'll most likely address all the questions towards the end. Um, so over to you, John. Thanks, Janine, and uh, I hope everyone can hear me. Can you just nod, Janine, if that's loud and clear at your end? All good, all good. Welcome everyone um, to, to the Spring Seasonal Climate Outlook. This is for the LLS region. So we get to drill down with some regional analysis uh, through the next 20 or so minutes. Obviously the, the climate is much more complex uh, than just a simple run through. We are going to look at using or analysing a few key drivers, um, but nonetheless, we'll do what we can in the, in the time allotted um, and see whether we can just unpack what's going on with our climate at the moment. So just kicking off with a, a current soil moisture through this LLS area in the Northwest New South Wales, uh, just a snapshot of how much soil moisture uh, is in the region, assuming some very um, broad and generic assumptions. Then the main part of the talk will be the climate drivers and, and having a look at what's happening at the moment um, and what's predicted to happen to these uh, the key influences of our climate here in, in this region. Air pressure patterns, um, the blocking highs, that really has been uh, the nemesis of, of our climate the last two to three years. We'll have a look at what's going on there. Is there a shift in, in the pattern? Um, and those blocking highs and their intensity to, to actually let some moisture in and to break this monotonous blue sky, uh, mild nights and frosty nights on some occasions. Then to finish off, uh, my, my 20 minutes will be just a seasonal forecast and the latest survey of, of the global models um, and just looking for trend analysis there and uh, whether we can pick up any guidance as to, to what may lay ahead for the next three months. Um, and then I'll hand over to Janine to, to kick off the, the remaining uh, 10 minutes looking at decision support. So having a look now at soil moisture, um, I'm not sure whether you're familiar with the Climate app. That's, uh, that's a, a really useful tool. Putting some broad assumptions in, in terms of soil parameters, um, that, that assumption there of plant available water would be coming out of a winter crop from last year. And that app generates how much plant available water would you have in the soil profile, assuming it had been fallowed from basically November in 2018 through to now. And that will be a function obviously of when the rain fell in that region and how much evaporation and how intense the rainfall event was. So that's remarkably accurate. We've got growers in the region through here that carry the probe with them and they comment how remarkably accurate this, this app is for for uh, measuring soil moisture. Just looking around the locations there, the different locations we can see, starting from the top, Corindai has had um, probably more, well obviously more rain than any other part of our LLS region uh, with 205 mils plant available water. That uh, setting there was for a, a heavy clay vertisol there with 230 mils of um, capacity. So yeah, probably harvested more than, than some of these lighter soils would. Looking at the pilliga, um, and that I, I must say the last column, which I didn't quite explain, the 30 percentile is um, a decile three or uh, the lowest 30 percent of rainfall um, ever recorded with all the available data that we've got going back to, to 1900. So the 5 percent there for the pilliga means that's the lowest 5 percent year to date uh, recorded rainfall. And then we look at Lightning Ridge, obviously they've been under a bit of a storm out there, 15%. They're not quite as, as low as on record. Then you look through most of the other locations and, and they're the driest in history. 
uh, year to date, 2019 so far to the end of June, and Bingara, etc. So low stored soil moisture pretty much throughout, with the exception of, of Corindai. Um, Dungown possibly picked up a little bit more rain uh, earlier in the year and since evaporated, but uh, a narrow bri, of course. The bucket is very low, which is probably not news to any of us um, living in this area. So if we dive straight in to have a look at the climate drivers, um, picking up any rural press, most of the press will be around what's happening with El Nino Southern Oscillation, um, or otherwise known as ENSO for short. A little bit of positive news here. You can see the red, the red line in the in the right chart up the top. That has come out of El Nino territory just just in the last few days. You'll see there below that blue line uh, was was in uh, El Nino classified territory, um, where there was a disconnect between the oceans that were showing a neutral signal down below that. You'll see the the ocean indices there in the white category. But it took a fair while for the atmosphere to to, uh, to line up and be coupled with, uh, with the ocean signal saying neutral. So that's just broken out of, out of um, El Nino thresholds back into neutral territory. So that's a really good sign. Um, so that means that the air circulation patterns um, are more in a neutral category, which gives us you know, more opportunities for random events to come through rather than uh, most of the the moisture circulation being on the eastern side of the Pacific Ocean, um, Chile, um, you know, America, South America, that, that part of the region. So uh, we do have lingering effects still, however, from central warming Pacific, um, which is, which is uh, impacting somewhat. But um, all those to one side, the story of, of 2019, without doubt, is the Indian Ocean Dipole, which is its next slide. So for those of you that aren't aware, just like the El Nino, La Nina situation in the, in the Indian Ocean, we have an Indian Ocean positive and negative Indian Ocean dipole. So the positive condition means the warm water and the, 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 um, the wet convective tropical moisture is on the western side of that basin and not the Australian side. So although it's called a positive IOD, it certainly is not positive for Australian farmers at this time of year anyway. So that's life cycle. The IOD life cycle is, is um, almost perfectly aligned with our winter crop. Um, the evolution does vary depending on what zone you're in, but you can see there, I guess the, the main take home from this, uh, this chart here, which is a, a refresh or a, a prediction, sorry, for, for two months time, a positive Indian Ocean dipole uh, is, is set to occur and to be consistent for the next couple of months. And, uh, and you know, in the past, these events have been particularly dry in the south across Victoria, South Australia, and Southern New South Wales. They're the, the major impact uh, areas affected by this condition. And, uh, and we'll just have a look at the evolution because I think there's, there's certainly something in, in this next um, couple of slides. So having a look when it impacts and where, um, and what are the consequences of, of the life cycle of this Indian Ocean is, uh, is, is, is certainly worth exploring in a bit more detail. You'll see there the June to August period, um, the impacts are, are felt across our area um, and we are right in the teeth of that at the moment, as you can tell there with the, with the, um, the red shading across much of our region. And then as we get out of this June to August period, something quite encouraging seems to occur. Um, and that is we, we're, we're not so much under the influence, the influence shifts further to the south of us and further to the west um, through South Australia and Victoria. Um, and I didn't put it in, but the next slide going into our summer rainfall, which we will explore again, is even a little bit more encouraging. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but the, uh, the northeastern sort of quarter, that does grow into uh, to come out into our region. So this is based on history, obviously, and you can find that um, those, those um, evolution maps on the link uh, below that I've got tabled there at the bottom of that chart. Um, and it's worth going online um, at your own convenience just to having a look at, you know, what does happen and when and, and where is that impact felt. So this chart here was generated from the last nine positive IOD events, and, and that's what we're in now. So look, there is a bit of hope 
for our climate in terms of what does happen. Um, and that's that's consistent with this, this next slide. So the last time this happened where we had a neutral ENSO situation in the winter and spring, um, and we had a positive Indian Ocean dipole, which is, of course isn't positive for rainfall. What actually happened when we came out of that spring or that dryish winter and, uh, and, and dryish spring? Well, what we can see there is that our rainfall deciles improved dramatically on, uh, on the winter and spring. And the last one was 2012-13, that dry or positive Indian Ocean dipole. So it's a really good one for those of you to check your, your rainfall records for the ends of those um, those four years where this actually happened. Um, so across the, uh, the northwest New South Wales area, here, um, much of those deciles for those four events, I've only tabled the one in 12-13, but the four events collectively, if you modelled them up, they're consistent with around a decile seven or eight rainfall for that summer season. Obviously there was differences when uh, that rain occurred, but pretty much consistently, you know, at the end of November, uh, when that dipole decayed, influences came in off the East Coast and, um, you know, thank goodness we saw some rain. Um, the Pilliga obviously there on, on a low or 10, 10 to 20% um, of, of rainfall for that period. but but if you look at the four events, um, they must have just been unlucky in, in that situation. So certainly that's that's worth having a look back through your own rainfall records or going onto the Bureau's website and having a look at um, at your nearest weather station or even the Climate app to see when it actually did break. I know that as we get into our out of our LLS onto the tablelands, um, these years were were much much better. Um, and there was good rain, you know, in the north of our state uh, when, when that actually occurred. So that's something a little bit encouraging. It is only history um, and there are, you know, always differences between events. There, there will be subtle differences, but, um, you know, a, a review of the science says that, you know, this is certainly worth considering. Blocking highs, well, I've just got a chart there that shows um, one high replacing another high, uh, you know, from a, a, a plot going back at the end of, or a couple of days ago, actually four days ago, showing uh, quite intense highs moving through the mid latitudes, which is um, the region referred to uh, that central eastern Australian area where we are. So one high replacing another high, um, all too consistent with what we've seen the last two to three years. And the, this drought that we're occurring, we're in at the moment, um, the highs have been more frequent and more intense. And, uh, and there was a, a research paper written to that effect studying the last 50 years and what's, what's happening with these highs. And, and um, so, you know, the last two years rainfall deficits haven't always been to blame on, on ENSO or IOD, but more so um, these intense blocking highs that come through. So, the air pressure really is the main mechanism that lets, uh, you know, that lets the moisture into our region. So it's it's worth having a, a check of what's actually, um, you know, if we can pick up some trends. So you'll see there on the top chart on this next slide, uh, winter 2016, which seems like a distant memory now, but that was the last time we we really saw some good winter and spring rainfall. What was this? What was the air pressure pattern looking like at that time? Well, you can see there with the SOI positive, we had um, low air pressure denoted by the, the blue, uh, light blue and dark blue shading to the north of us. And that's that's our moisture highway, um, you know, tracking south over, you know, central eastern parts of, of eastern Australia. So uh, that was far more favourable. You can see there on the, on the northwest of New South Wales, you can see that uh, negative Indian Ocean dipole there uh, was tracking moisture, you know, out of the northwest available to, to access our region. But we look at the autumn this year um, and you know we've got completely reverse scenario where we've got high air pressure over the equatorial tropics north of Australia and that really hasn't been conducive to, to moisture transport into more southern areas of, our, of, of, of Australia. So and then if we fast forward and just comparing again that bottom panel with the, the one now uh, taken off the, um, the NOAA website yesterday there seems to be some reason for a little bit of optimism and improvement. We, we are seeing low air pressure 
I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, coming to the, um, the Northern Coral Sea and the, the, the equatorial um, tropics through there seems to be, uh, the, the high air pressure seems to be abating somewhat. There is, um, you know, we'd prefer to see far more uh, lower air pressure through the mid latitudes, but it does look to be improving somewhat. And that's the 30 day anomaly, of course, for, for air pressure. So look, there is a little bit of, um, you know, there are steady shifts there, but the Indian Ocean dipole condition is really um, the signature position for these highs and, and, and the pattern that we see, the wave train pattern through the, um, through the southern areas of, of South Australia and, and, and right through to South America is consistent with the Indian Ocean dipole positive events. Um, which you're in right now, but hopefully that's set to change like it has in history in, to, in, in those previous years mentioned. Moving along now to the seasonal models, well, what can we pick up? Um, we can look at history, but the seasonal models will be more accurate in terms of, of um, you know, picking up nuances with air pressure um, or changes in local SSTs and, uh, and other things that are going on. Um, warmer, uh, you know, hotter earth surface. All these things will, will be picked up um, by the, the really uh, the high tech computer models, um, the supercomputers that generate these, these forecasts. And what we see here, we certainly don't have consistency uh, or consensus with our, with our spring. Well, it's not spring actually, it's, it's August, September, October, but it feels like spring starts on, on the first week in August at times. Um, so what we're seeing is, is very much a, um, a split um, on, on how we see these next three months unfolding. The US government model um, is showing, they are quite optimistic with a wetter scenario coming up and again through summer um, with, with their outputs for that period. And, but overall, obviously there's, there's um, the majority are in the dry condition, um, but notably they're not all consistently showing dry. Um, and the, um, the weather models are predicting a flip to La Nina um, out of the neutral territory to, to La Nina, but at the moment they are minority. So we still do have a majority in the drier conditions, but we're not seeing all of them consistently in that category, which is, I guess, um, you know, some small cause for optimism, I guess, if, you know, as we all look for rain. Now here's a model you may not all know about. Um, this is something that's funded by um, a group of RDCs, including MLA, um, which obviously includes meat, um, cattle and sheep, and grains and cotton. For those producers out there, this, this site is certainly worth keeping an eye on. Now, the, the researchers at the Bureau have given us access, and you guys as, as producers access to to the back end of their modelling to have a look at their model. This is not, this is a password protected site. Um, and the login details and access details are, are in the survey post this webinar where you can um, put your, put a user, a generic user and password detail in. So this is one that's worth looking at. And, and the chart there is actually for um, the September rainfall prediction month two. Um, and there is some, some new tools on there. There's a pie chart. Uh, that you can drop down and find your town in the domain drop down menu here. Um, so it's it's worth having a look at. There are only a few multi-week models, which is the period from eight to 21 days. And this is one of them. Um, other ones you do have to subscribe to, which can, can, uh, can cost you money. But this one is available. And um, I guess that the Bureau and the researchers at the Bureau, I've circled the feedback tab there, if that can be, um, if you know, if you have any feedback on using that tool, this is in research grade at the moment. So any feedback you've got is useful, but that will break the forecast into different months and, uh, and different weeks as well. So if we see a shift in the climate, hopefully it will come up here. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so that's worth noting. It's not, not overly uh, well publicized and among the ADC community, um, most people are, trying to get advisors and, and producers to have a look at this site. Weather models, well, uh, weather models, we still do need these. Um, I know the colour charts can drive people completely bananas at times, but we do need these. These, these will models, the shorter term 0 to 8 day models, 
uh, will be the first ones to pick up the East Coast system. So when the Indian Ocean Dipole does decay in October, um, if we get easterly influences, the weather models will pick up these systems much quicker than the climate models. Um, they can develop in, in four to five days, these East Coast systems, so we need to be keeping one eye uh, certainly on these, and that's just probably the most common one that people use. And I've just cut and pasted the link into, into the, um, the text box there for those that, that weren't sure where to find that one. So that's taken this morning. It has been jumping around a little bit. We do have, we, we have seen some systems come and go on the, on the North Queensland coast and, and, uh, and a few on the sort of uh, North or well, Northern New South Wales area, but, but nothing has really come inland yet. So that's probably the, the keen area of interest for me um, to see one of those systems um, if once we get through August to see one of those systems come inland and to wet us, I think in the spring period. Um, so just wrapping up in summary, the Indian Ocean Dipole uh, is, the, is the main influence at the moment along with the blocking highs. So ENSO in the neutral phase or the neutral condition at the moment um, is really not having a great influence, although there's some lingering warm water through the Central Pacific uh, that, that still could be having some effect. August, the, having a review of the models um, in my role with Cotton Info, August appears to be uh, more of the same, unfortunately. And I, I think until uh, the Indian Ocean Dipole evolution just runs its course, it does look like August could be, we could see more of the same, but let's hope we can get something through this next four week period. Um, and the optimism increases somewhat, you know, once we get out of this, uh, this, this, uh, this late winter, early spring period, and, uh, and hopefully these East Coast systems can ramp up and give us some, some cores and some farming activity. God knows we, we certainly are hanging out for, for a, a really good one to 200 mil rain event. And just, just to, to finish off, if we look back through history, um, check your farm rainfall or your local rainfall records for those four years I've mentioned there where we, we have seen a neutral ENSO condition and a positive IOD event. So that's worth worth going back through and just having a look at what actually happened at your given location and when that actually did break in those years. Um, as I said, it varies from in the eastern side of the, of, of the um, LLS region um, against the, the northern tablelands. That did break around October, November for, for much, much of that area, but a little bit later um, as you got further west. So that's, that's, worth, um, that's worth checking out, which is a nice bit of optimism, hopefully, um, going forward. So that's finishing up from me. I'll just change quickly to give the mouse to Janine and uh, we can run through some useful decision support. And I certainly welcome any questions in the chat bar or, um, or at the end when Janine has finished her presentation. So over to you, Janine, and thank you. Excellent. Um, I I have two screens. Can you see my Google screen, John? Good. Okay. So, being a climate forecast um, webinar, the main decision support tools that we'll be looking at today are the ones that have a climate or a weather. Um, I guess, basis behind them. Decision support, for those of you who don't really know, it's essentially a software program, um, either in terms of internet or an app that can give you information to help you make management or business decisions. So the ones that we're going to look at today are in the Climate Kelpie website, which is an excellent uh, climate website. So as you can see here, I've popped Climate Kelpie into my search engine and it's the top one to come up. So if you click through into that, just wait, a bit slow internet, um, you'll see Climate Kelpie and it is exactly what it says, rounding up climate tools for Australian farmers. It's a great go-to site and you've probably seen some of these um, dog, climate dog explanations before. But we'll go through to the menu bar up here, which is these lines. 
and click on decision support tools. So what they've done here is they've basically tried to link together all the decision support tools relevant to farmers in one place. What I'm going to do is just make the region New South Wales, just narrows it down a little bit. Um, as you can see, there's quite a few of them here. Some of them are uh, industry specific, for example, cool cows. Um, cod assist, there's some quite industry specific one. There's also um, quite a few kind of generic ones. So I guess there's a bit of a difference between decision support tools. You'll find the more information that you have to input and the more time you've got to spend on it, basically the more personalised the information is going to be. So some of these tools don't require any input. It's just a case of giving you some historic information or some forecast information with weather, for example. Um, I've gone through and found, I've went, been through all of these. Um, so the BOM app, for example, is everything BOM in an app. Uh, there's a little bit of an um, explanation on the front. Um, but what I've done is picked a few out that might be of interest. The Arm Online is quite an interesting collection of tools, particularly for cropping. Um, it had some good um, forecasts. I'll just quickly show you this. Um, crop Arm. So basically you can put some really simple inputs in, choose a site, um, in New South Wales would be helpful. So some of these are yeah, quite simple and still can give you some good information. Um, apply. So this one is looking for different cropping. This is a yield forecast based on the current um, weather conditions and on those simple um, bits of information I put in. You can also have a look and say, look, I'm going to call it rapidly rising. It looked like it was coming up quite quickly. Oh, hang on. And so look, looking at these different inputs, you can get a pretty good um, little yield forecast. So that was a good one, I thought. The um, on um, Arm Online, so that was the crop arm. That was one of them there. Ask Bill was a sheep uh, one that we took a look at. It was quite, um, well, the Arm ones are free. That was the other thing. Um, so they're free. But the Ask Bill one has does, you can do a free trial, but it is a paid service. So this one, you actually put in a fair bit of information. Um, so this is gets down to really into the management and the operation level of um, the um, livestock sheep specifically. So I just went and put in a semi make believe um, place in. I don't have any sheep, um, but you can basically put in your pasture, some livestock details, some um, different different groups of animals. You can add in um, quite simple little ways to, if you're doing something, so joining, for example, and you might just follow the prompts and it's it's quite a simple, um, simple tool, this one. So you do have to put a reasonable amount of information in, but it can give you some that should, okay. Anyway, I probably was doing that a bit fast. Um, so what the outputs of this one are essentially is it will give you, um, based on some weather events, it will trigger some risks for your different properties and livestock groups. My internet is slow. And it will say, oh, for a particular property, 
Um, if there's no risks or it will look at your pasture, flies, cold, heat and things like that. So this was a pretty good management level one. Um, on that one, we'll go back. So that one was paid, but you can do a um, a free trial on that one. The bomb was good. Cattle heat loads for feed lots. Climate, um, John, I think, showed a couple of graphs out of Climate. It's got some really good information. Um, I'll just pop over to here. The Climate one also free. Um, you can do a few... Uh, yield forecast on that one with some pretty simple inputs. Uh, it's got some good, um, using historical information, some good uh, likelihoods of particular events on there. So that one can be quite useful. There's a few others in here that are quite specific. This farm for profit was um, another one that I just wanted to go through. And it's quite more of a higher level. The Ask Bill and some of the other ones are quite operation level um, tools, but this is a higher level business tool. And it is free and it is mixed. It seemed to have sheep and um, Oh, login. Okay. I did go through and put in some different um, inputs for the farm for profit. And so basically you can put in your enterprise mix, your farm assets that you have and some overarching expenditure and income line items. And what it does, it goes through and it will tell you, is there some of the outputs there? No. So yeah, it goes through and it will tell you the return on asset and how your business is performing at a higher level. So um, look at some of the key expenditure items and say, oh, well, on average farms, equivalent farms would be spend this percentage of their um, expenditure on in say nitrogen management or on livestock, Cost. So it was a quite a good a high level business tool um, that forecast for profit. A uh, good one to use if you were looking to, to have a major investment or management change. If you wanted to change your enterprise mix or to make an investment on another farm, for example, so that was quite a good um, high level business tool. So there's quite a number of different ones. I mean, some of them, a lot of these ones. Well, the forecast for profit, actually, just before I finish on that one, all of these tools do use climate and weather within them. The forecast for profit shows a 10-year potential um, gross margin on the whole farm and it looks uses the historical weather records and your proposed enterprise mix to then look at the profitability of the um, farm for the next 10 years. So that's using some weather information there. Um, quite a quite a bit of information here, basically take your time, have a look through. Lots of them are free, there's a few paid ones, but they're all very good tools um, to work your way through. So Climate Kelpie, it's a key website that has got those all together uh, with decision support tools. So I'd say uh, yeah, that's a good one to look at. I'll just see, we still don't have any questions. If anyone wants to ask a question in the chat bar, which you'll find on the right, you just type it in and we can answer any of your questions for you. So, um, so I have a question for you, yes. Janine. Um, so the business, yes. the business tool, uh, so you download your nearest weather station through Silo, and that generates a um, ten-year uh, ten rolling average of output. Is that how they account for the risk in that situation? That's right. Yes. So obviously they're just looking at the historical weather records, and based on the probability of um, particular seasons coming ahead. So you couldn't look at that one and see year three 